Good morning. There we go. Is it How y'all doing? Good? Good. All right. Checking if, you know, life check. Proof of service. I'm going to do a little bit yeah, of cheating here just, just so I can see each other. Yeah, right? see yeah. each other. Back up. Yeah. I like that idea. You guys don't mind, right, from a film perspective? It might so. mess up the cameras, but yeah, we're here Steve, for them, right? I'm in it for the profile. I've actually only liked my profile anyway, yeah. so. All right. Um, welcome to our panel on mental health and burnout. How does empathy power security? Uh, I'm Lance James, and I'm thrilled to moderate today's discussion with an esteemed group of cybersecurity leaders. I've met, I got to meet them all this week. It's been really, really fascinating. Some of the backside conversations is really awesome, and so... Um, each of them brings a wealth of experience and a shared belief in the power of empathy to strengthen not just our teams, but also our security postures. Let's welcome Graham Ludlow, the uh, SVP and CISO of Marriott Vacations Worldwide, a strategic thinker who integrates emotional intelligence with technical expertise to lead his teams. I had uh, sat with next to him with dinner, and it was a great conversation, and uh, uh, I think you'll really be impressed on, on some of the, the pragmatic but also EQ concepts he's going to bring to the table today. Um, next we have Mikesh Chandramahan, the group CISO of Aditya Birla Capital, also known as ACBL, I think, right? ACBO? Yep. Uh, or, yeah. yeah. Um, whose cross-vertical experience and commitment to net new technologies are shaping the future of cybersecurity leadership. Um, Sam Curie, joining us here, uh, the CISO at Zscaler also a friendly Canadian, um, so whose contributions to the field are diverse in his role, uh, also always, in, uh, bleh, always emphasizing the human element in security. Um, and last but not least, did we say Stephon Bennett? No, it was good. So, <laughs> Stephen Bennett, the global CISO of Domino's Pizza. Yes, they need, you know, they get attacks too, enterprises, whose innovative strategies and hands-on approach have made significant impacts across the cybersecurity landscape. All right, so today we are gonna dive into a topic that touches all of us, the critical role empathy plays in cybersecurity. Now, we're also new to this conversation. We're gonna ask you to be a little empathetic if we have to stop and think about our answers. Please, you know, show a little, you know, empathy. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not just safeguarding systems. We're supporting people in an era where burnout is all too common. How many people feel like they've been burned out in their jobs before? So, right? Yeah, right? Um, so cultivating empathy isn't just about like workplace wellness. It's about building resilient defenses. If you're vulnerable at, in, the, in the mind and body, you're vulnerable at work. You're vulnerable in your organization. Um, our panelists will share their insights on fostering a supportive culture and striking that balance, both work and in play, and implementing strategies to combat burnout. You guys ready? All right. Yep. Bye, bye, bye. Woo. Okay. Sorry. Ready. Okay. Graham, we're going to start with you. you. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to get all the things over here. I usually like look this way. Uh, so you successfully led teams uh, through significant security projects, and by emphasizing what mission-driven dri ethos, could you share with us how this approach impacts team dynamics, particularly under stress, and what practices you found most effective in building resilience among your security professionals? Yeah, thank you for the question, Lance. I have a very mission-driven approach to information security because what we do is bigger than our individual jobs. It's really, I see it as sort of good versus bad. We're on the side of good, we're helping, we're building, we're preventing bad things from happening. Mm -hmm. So while that can motivate people, it can give them a strong, passionate reason to do their jobs and do it well, it also increases their stress. Mm. Because if you're just patching a server and then you go home, that's one thing, but if you're defending people's lives against hackers who are going to try to steal their identities and you fail, mm -hmm. that's a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about striking a balance between inspiring people to be invested in their jobs, to mm -hmm. do a good job, and to be satisfied with what they can accomplish versus the stress of if they can't get the job done or they feel like they haven't succeeded. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it comes into forgiveness, allowing people to be imperfect and not being really hard on people when they don't always get the job done. So what I do to manage that is while I inspire them to be mission driven, to mm. balance that with empathy, with basically forgiveness for when people don't do the job just right. Yeah, kind of reminds me of when my first network job where I was like testing something and I was supposed to be on a different network and I accidentally art poisoned the entire network for the patch management system and I was shaking 
I had an empathetic boss, and he was a lot older than I, and I was in my young 20s, and he was like, Lance, calm down. We, we all have gone through something like this. This is your first. Yep. And he had a good talk with me. He's like, but I need you going to focus. We're going to solve this, and we'll worry about all that later, but you're fine. You're not getting fired. It's going to be fine. And then I remember passing it on to when I was a CISO at Flashpoint, we had the same thing. One of our interns screwed up and was freaking out, and we made sure that it's like, let's solve this, and then we're going to talk about it's okay, and it's, it's fine. Yeah, it's awesome. Nice to hear. So, all right, from Makesh, your experience spans a remarkable breadth of industries, such, uh, each with its own cybersecurity challenges. Um, how have you applied your empathetic leadership to foster a supportive environment tailored to these ver you know, varied settings? And what impact has this had on your team's mental health and productivity? So, uh, uh, thanks for the question, Lance. Um, for me, uh, an empathetic leadership uh, comes from multiple parameters which I look at from. Uh, one is like being a good listener, um, very actively and uh, with full authenticity, uh, listen to uh, people, what they say. Uh, second is like um, uh, have 360 degree uh, feedback mechanism looped around the, all your stakeholders. Uh, second is um, look, at, look at the perspective of uh, what your teams, what your stakeholders, what your stakeholders from the different functions uh, goes through. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, one of the points is like uh, while you are actually giving an empowerment to your team, ensure that you are there behind them to ensure that um, if, there, if, if there are any errors, if there are any mistakes, that you own that to ensure that they go ahead and explore the opportunities. Uh, so that gives a lot of freedom for them to uh, uh, innovate stuff, and come with a new out-of-box solutions. Mm -hmm. um, it also gives uh, a sense of purpose for them be, to be in that particular profile. Because in today's context, uh, uh, as the topic was related to a mental health of uh, a CISOs on the CISOs function, when I say CISOs, it's not related only to a designated CISOs. I feel that it is for information on cybersecurity professionals, right? And we as a professional has to ensure that we have a proper fraternity to support our ecosystem so that openly we can actually go back and have a fallback mechanism if there is a crisis. I have somebody else to have and mentor. I have somebody else to support the ecosystem. It's something which we have to create so that the day-to-day -day activities of uh, a CISO function can be much more smoother with much more efficiency uh, which can actually drive down for the purpose of the organization, mm -hmm. which will have a long-term impact of uh, CISO. Yeah, and, and, and I, I heard a saying years ago, and it's like a, more like a, probably like a Sufi or like Buddhist type saying, and it was like, love is great, but being understood is profound. And I think what you're doing is also you're creating a runway for the innovation, the, the, and you're giving them that space, because, you know, the, Running, running that environment, you're dealing with engineers, techs, this and that, all these different personalities. And uh, it's great to, to see that you're providing that creative space for them to, to thrive and stuff and, and, and understanding. So, awesome. Thank you for your answer on that. So, Sam, <laughs> um, you, you've often spoken about the importance of power skills. Yeah. You know, such as emotional intelligence within cybersecurity teams. Can you discuss? How you've cultivated these within your organization and the role they play in creating a work environment resilient to burnout. Yeah, so uh, the first thing I'll say is some of people may have heard of power skills as soft skills, uh, mm. and I hated the term. Yeah, so, me too. I feel you. <laughs> so if, if you want, pull out your phones and Google soft skills or power skills, and you'll see it's actually quite a collection of skills. Mm -hmm. And they're not easy. Uh, they're, in fact, quite hard. And, and some folks in the audience uh, might be saying, well, I don't have those skills, or they're not for me, but you can learn them. Uh, these are things like communication, these are things like presentation, understanding, and that, I loved your quote on being understood, uh, because we are much more than the verbal, the content of what we say. Mm -hmm. We are also, we are telegraphing, we are receiving, we are social creatures. And the more you begin to understand that, the more you can start to use that as a tool. So, for instance, I, I, back in the 90s, I met uh, a friend of mine in Germany, he said, 
and I was beginning to manage people and larger and larger groups of people, he said, your employees should see you angry once. And it really bothered me when he said that. Mm. It seemed very utilitarian, um, or rather like I was using anger as a tool, but I kept it. And later I went, I was at RSA, as you know, a CTO, and we were in the breach. Man, the anxiety you could have cut with a knife. Mm. So when, when and, and so in a culture where you're constantly under fire as a CISO, or as anybody in the security department, you begin to, to telegraph anxiety as a, to, to, to display urgency. And I changed jobs at one point and I got a new boss. Mm. And there was a very serious thing happening. And I noticed that his, uh, his name was Leo, that his body language changed in a crisis, it went calm. And this was a huge lesson for me. And, and I said, you know, he could see I was anxious and I was partly because I was used to telegraphing to my bosses, this matters. And he said, Sam, no one's going to die today. <laughs> now, in some crises, people do die. Yeah. But it may, I realized this one wasn't one of those. We're not soldiers. So, yeah. and, so, and he said, well, we know what the problem is. And to your point about, you know, welcome. You know, you've had your first crisis. We all have them. I realized that in a leadership position to some extent, I had to, I had to radiate that calm. Mm -hmm. And there were times when I needed to to consciously elevate it because they would pick up on it mm -hmm. and it would very much set the tone. And there's nothing quite as reassuring as when you've done something wrong and you look to your manager and you're working hard and you're, you've got that shaky feeling like it's gonna go wrong and they're telegraphing like, this is okay, right? Learn from it, it's good, you're not gonna be judged for this. It's like when you do a retrospective in engineering and there's no judgment in the room, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. you know that you're, you're gonna come out of this and your career will continue on its path having learned something and that's yeah. super important. So the, the, I like the term power skills because they're hard. And I'll tell one other quick anecdote. When I went to work for CA, there was a vice president there who had autism. Mm. And one of the characteristics of autism, which I knew nothing of at the time, is empathy is, or EQ is usually fairly low. And he was a highly effective VP. And the reason he was, was he put effort into developing EQ, mm -hmm. meaning you can study it. So if you're in the audience going, man, I'm, that's not me, all the soft stuff, squishy mm. stuff, no thank you, um, you can actually learn power skills and pay attention. So whether or not you have it as an intuitive thing, uh, you know, might think, well, some people have it, and some people have IQ, and I'm not that. You can actually study this and pick up on it, and it is a learnable skill mm. or set of skills and usable by you, even if you're not the touchy-feely one. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> There's a lot there. there. No, yeah. this, is, this is actually great. It just, I, I'm going to relate to this in, in, in the lessons I've had. Was, um, I worked with an engineering team, and their communication skills are a little bit like, like this stereotypically, but there's certain ones. Obviously, there were certain people that had different things, but a lot of the times they're like the leave me alone, why are you talking to me, you know, type perspective. And uh, I went and actually studied organized psychology myself to understand how I'm good with the individual, but how, how do I like try to also like get the entire team to feel understood as a whole? And uh, it just reminded some of your stories of just anecdotes. I remember like having to study this and, and it is, it's uh, even the people that do have the natural yeah. individual ability, there is bigger than that too. And it really comes back to that beginner, the beginner's mind, a mistake is just a learning opportunity. And I think that's the problem is we really need to redefine failure and what that concept really is in the environment that we're in. There's so. one other thing, I, you mentioned we're both Canadians. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm gonna say this because if I'm part of the diversity uh, and to share a little vulnerability, I went perhaps too far on the empathic scale in my career early on mm -hmm. and was often told I was too nice. Yeah. Uh, and, and Canadians are sort of known as the nicer North Americans, right? Right. They misunderstood this sometimes as in unable to make difficult decisions. And so culturally adapting to being in the United States was tough because suddenly they'd see a harder side of us. And be, I don't know if it was the same for you. Oh, I get that. People They're are like, like wow, you swing hard. And I'm like, well, I yeah. didn't just because I'm, I'm kind by choice. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I, I apologize that I, I fired you with the word sorry in there in A twice. Mm -hmm. but we're just as capable of making hard decisions. It just doesn't fit your social paradigm. So yeah. it, one of the things to demonstrate was when you're doing empathy, you have to be culturally aware internationally. And strangely, Canadians and people from the United States, it was very difficult to get that culture yep. yeah. to accept that. So I'm just putting it out there. Be careful that you don't overcorrect. So maybe my German friend's advice 
I, I've, had to, I've had personally as a Canadian, I've had to, I didn't realize, I didn't put it together that it was a Canadian thing, oh, yeah. right? I just took it as like, I'm either hot or cold. And I realized, because people are like, wow, you're great, like in this moment. And then suddenly it's like a hard decision. Like you're not afraid to obviously make a really hard decision and you're a little bit cold about it. I'm like, it's a business decision. Ruthless in some cases. It, absolutely ruthless yeah. sometimes. Yeah, I, I get you on that. And I, actually, the last time that happened to me, though, I, it, I think it was shocked them at first, but they were also needing that in that moment. And so it was this weird, like, the scenario itself kind of made it work so, itself out. But a, absolutely, outside of that, they probably we'll, would have been like, we'll I don't know what to do. We'll save it for the Canadian Therapy Club later, but yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah therapy's always a good thing. So, all right. So, thank you for your, uh, it's that on Sam. That's awesome, awesome stuff. Um, so, for Stephon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, Stephen, um, your approach to leadership involves more of a profound understanding of the challenges faced by your teams, right? You're listening, big listener. Um, how has your hands-on involvement shaped your leadership and the strategies you implement to support mental health within Domino's? Okay, um, I think a, a large factor for me is being able to walk in the shoes of another person. It's very difficult to empathize with somebody if you don't really know what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And I think Early on in my career, I discovered as a, a CISO, you're obviously pushed hard to think very business focused. You should be an, an ambassador for cybersecurity. You should be pitching everything at a, a certain level. Um, and I think what seems to get forgotten sometimes is a lot of us, our origins are from a technical background. Um, so I think it's actually really important to, to maintain, I guess, some of those uh, those technical skills and to mm -hmm. be able to understand, you know, what the, your staff who are actually on the front line are, are actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very easy as a CISO. I'll give you an example. Um, so as a CISO, uh, I've put in lots of measures. We have lots of automation going. We're going, oh, 20% of our calls are closed with automation. We have run books. We've put in lots of security systems and services. We have our SLAs are amazing. And then you start noticing that some of the team members are a little bit frayed around the edges. Mm. Um, and so what I actually did is I, I worked <laughs> at the tier one and tier two calls. Mm. Uh, and all I do is um, for a month, for half a day, I work on the tier one and tier two calls. So you become an individual contributor. You, you, yeah. you sit there and... And it was that. horrific. Um, I had this preconception that, you know, all of my figures and all my stats look good. The reports look great on paper, um, but when I actually worked in that environment, and then you realize that, okay, yes, I've got these amazing tools, but then I've, I've got four different screens that I'm trying to run from. I've got loads of playbooks, but I'm trying to search them, and calls are coming in, and you, you're kind of getting overwhelmed, and it, it actually really made me understand that sometimes what you may perceive as what the status is isn't actually true until you actually get in there and I guess get your, your hands dirty. So mm -hmm. I think that was the, the key one for me. And, and to be honest, from a purely selfish reason, um, keeping my fingers in with the technology helps me as a person yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think that's, that's why I really push you know, for that hands-on involvement um, to the point that we have a, um, it's turned into a mental health day, but early on I put in this concept of a nerd day so once a month, uh, we usually go off-site as a team, and the intent there really is to do something that you wouldn't normally do in your day-to-day -day job, because yeah. you don't have time. Um, and that you can choose something that's maybe business-related, but out of your comfort zone. So you might be a GRC specialist, but you want to really look at reverse engineering malware. And I think, again, that helped really build a bond with a team and start trying to empathize with people in an environment that was, it was away from work and it was people doing things that they love to do. Mm -hmm. So you could really start to see, I guess, where those passions were. Mm. So there's, a, there's this funny thing about cybersecurity and a lot of people from the outside think it's this glamorous, you know, just exciting position. And, and, I, and, I, and someone asked me once to say, what would you say that people really do? And I say, respect the mundane. It's everything everybody needs from you. And your group, your tier one, your tier twos, they're doing hard mundane work all day with the pressure of like, if, this, if we miss something, if we miss that, you know, eyes on glass, like, is our automation up to snuff? Is this all yeah, these yeah. things? And that's taxing. 
it's like in a watch room for, you know, you know and, and you're just, you gotta watch the patterns, right? And uh, building in that the nerd day, you know, like the, the allowing them to feel like they can express themselves, mm. just like you also jumping in, that's your nerd day. Yeah, uh, you, wanna, you wanna also, you need a nerd day just as much as them. And the reality is, is you're, you're exposing yourself and you're learning about their creativity side. You're learning that. You guys are literally like breaking bread together in a, in a cool like a hackathon moment yeah. or this and that. And, and that's extremely powerful because, you know, I, I, I recall a situation where I remember when I got put in this new position, I immediately just asked people on the one-on-one, so what, what's your dream? What's your, what do you want to do? One person was like, I actually want to be a CTO someday, right? And the nerd day opens that up. Oh, you want to get into reversing mm-hmm. and stuff. We all have jobs. Sometimes we just got to do the job. And security, re- like, to get that exciting security job usually either doesn't last very long. Like, evangelist. I'm evangelist. I, I see the layoff points on that. That's the first to go. And on the other side of it, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, you don't always get the malware reversing job. Or even if you do, it's like you're writing articles for people to pretty much work for the marketing department, right? But you're not actually solving a problem, right? So there is going to always be this, like, letdown and this and that. Or you accept this is just part of this job. Mm. But it doesn't mean you, let's not, let's go out and have some fun. Let's go build something. Let's do something with the new GBD model. Or let's go do this with like malware. Or let's go do this and see what we can do to automate this. And sometimes it might end up going, you know what, we could use that later. You we know? Have, we so. have actually. There's, there's been a few things that we've had from the nerd days that we've yeah. implemented. It's yeah. been something really, really powerful. And then the team are behind it because they've, they've been there at the origin of it as well. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. That's an it's an amazing way to like run a team, especially if they're like doing a lot of that hard sweat work to 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 make everything secure. So yeah, um, and it's underappreciated a lot of times. So it sounds like you're really you know adding into that appreciation and giving them that opportunity. All right, we're gonna go more in a general thing and run around and just do it. Do you guys want to go from this way, or do you want to go back down? Are you need a rest? I'm easy. Okay, cool. All right, so I might just go from here and then down, and then uh, we'll go from there. So to all y'all. Um, can you share a real life scenario where empathy played a decisive role in overcoming a cybersecurity challenge? Additionally, two parter. All right, wait for oh, it. No, I didn't realize it was a two parter. It's always two parter. I've changed my mind. You can start yeah, at the end. Okay, all right. So we'll start. <laughs> You'll yeah. go you, yeah. So two parter. So I'll go back just because we, you know, flow wise. Um, so, first part question is can you share a real life scenario? where empathy played a massively decisive role in overcoming a cybersecurity challenge. Secondly, how do you maintain a culture of continuous learning and adaptability to cope with the ever-evolving threat landscape while also supporting your team's mental health? So we'll start with number one and then we can obviously explore that. Right, so, so yeah. you want me first, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So give the, him some thinking time. So a real life scenario where empathy helped, um, I'll say the most important one, the job I, I left and came to Zscaler in March, so the job I left, uh, I think I've said this publicly a few times actually at the show, is I think the biggest problem in security is the gap between cybersecurity and the business. Mm. And so what I, so my last company was uh, Cyber Reason. I made it clear I had a mission and that I was above no role, no job, no function. It was very similar to walking a mile in the shoes of the support folks. And um, Because when you're sitting down opposite others, you, trust is really important. And you're yeah. trying to establish trust. It's not just credibility, you know, that I'm a... I'm a cyber person or that I'm going to be there for them, they have to know I want the same outcome. And it isn't just a spreadsheet exercise. It's not, oh, yeah, look, we got a few more calls and they're open longer. No, no, that, that's not pain. Mm. And so when they've seen me suffer the same pain, so mm. do I know what the customers are suffering? Have I been on the calls? So we did rotations, departmental rotations. Healthy trauma bonds, look at that. But we did multiple <laughs> ones, right. So, so I had devs, my, my DevSecOps people who were doing like the IAM uh, you know, what, what's the access model going to be for AWS and for GCP, I had them go and spend two sprints in DevOps and vice versa. And mm. we did the same thing. All functions wound up doing rotations that didn't burden us much. But I started to think in terms of, of empathy debt. So whenever we did this stuff, what was the burden we were putting on the others? And, and I worked in a team and there was a culture that was very much, uh, yeah, just get it done, just move ahead, just achieve the mission. And I was making it absolutely clear, no, 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 we're not here to make life worse for other people. Um, and I think this was, this was really important because we weren't going to trust each other if when I sat down and asked them, please reduce, do this to reduce risk, if they didn't think that I actually cared about the same business outcome or I cared about what their day-to-day life was going to be. And that, that was super important. Um, 
Now, mental burnout is the other half of this. And I, and I, I think that if you don't do this, we as CISOs and security people, we, we, put, up a, we put up a barrier, right? We, we, there's a, there's a this, I, look, I'm a CISO and I know all my stuff. And uh, you come and ask me a security question and I will have an answer no matter what. It's, a, you know, if another C-level comes to you and says, this was in the news this morning, you're like, did I read that this morning or was I in the commute, right? And so you, come up, you have to come up with an answer and it has to be defensible and you have to do it fast. Uh, and, um, and so you've always got this veneer of almost cyber perfection. So you're actually impeding empathy the other way. Uh, and what I've found on the mental burnout side is the more you do that, the more isolated you become and the worse that gap gets between security and business. And I'm mentioning this because it leads to us wanting to quit our jobs. Absolutely. It leads to us uh, literally going for therapy or turning to substance abuse or mm -hmm. not living well or being yeah. frustrated or at forgetting home. forgetting your family or this and that. It all adds because you're putting all that energy yeah. And we go, we that. turn to yeah. like the dopamine, you know, yeah. hit of constantly on the phone or, you know, what yeah. have you. Um, and that, that's not healthy. Yeah. So, what I've found is if you break it down and you demonstrate that you don't always have the answer, so the CFO comes to you and says, did you see this SEC filing? And then what do you think? And you're like, you know, I haven't read it yet. What do you think? Uh, one of the most impressive things to do as an executive is to ask for help. Absolutely. And, and so I took some coaching, um, a guy named Brad Spencer. Always give credit, by the way. It's a good look. Always default to it. Even if you did it, give credit to someone on your team if they were involved. So this guy, Brad Spencer, was a coach, and they did this analysis, personality-wise, of executives, and he said, the rarest thing you see at the C-level, and the people who tend to get trusted the most and accomplished the most are the ones that demonstrate an ability to ask for help when they need it and to know when they need help. People trust that person. Like, if someone walks up to you from another department and says, I don't know how to do this one, but I think you do, could you help me? Mm -hmm. Nobody says no. And that is an ask for empathy back. It's a vulnerability sharing. So I just thought I'd put it out there because that has helped me. It's not a specific example. Yeah. But if, you, if you're worried that you can't, if you're up late at night and you're not sleeping for whatever reason, you're feeling alone and isolated and maybe I should look at another company, or maybe I should be doing something else, that might be the reason. A lot of people don't realize their feelings, something like, you know, and, and I just want to quickly just curtail this because it's actually important. At the individual level, your feelings are a biological signal to tell you there's something you need to follow through on and listen to. And a lot of people, in, in, at least in the Western world, mm. I'm not sure how it is here, um, and I don't want to make an assumption, but we t we're trained to kind of like avoid that, and then we wonder why the anxiety keeps building up until we get to the therapist, and then they give us the tools and go, by the way, you haven't released this, or you're not looking at this way. But it's actually something you want to lean into and go, why am I getting this anxiety? What's happening to me? And, and, and share that. it, you're telegraphing. A, and share it because that, gets, that removes the isolation. That is, that's the issue. And that sharing vulnerability part also, if you're a leader, you're a CISO, you're setting the stage to let everybody else know it's also okay to ask for help. And do it here. So, yeah. Right, yes. do it with each other here. Yeah. This so. is a therapy session, by the way. Yep. So. And I think it goes the other way as well, actually, when you're talking about the CISO and the role. I think, unfortunately, you can uh, introduce burnout as a learned skill to your to your team members. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of the challenges that I have is that um, my team members see how I operate, that I answer the phone at really stupid times at the night, that I'm always a little bit on edge and frantic. And I think one of the things we need to be careful of, and I've noticed it in some of my team members, that you know, I'll send an email at a really stupid time in the morning and they'll answer. Or I'll, I'll have a Teams message and they'll respond or there's an issue in Europe and it's one in the morning and they've decided to just jump on board. And I think a lot of it is the fact that they look at you as the CISO and go, well, that's the norm. That's what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And it's a really difficult situation because then you can turn around and go, oh, well, well don't do as I do. Yeah. You know? but, but, but actually can't. instead do better and set that tone. Yeah. At the same yeah, time. I have a great example of this. I'll, I'll keep this short because I know we have a couple more here. But recently, literally a few weeks ago, we were under, you know, I were in an organic company, so this, the stress can be up and down, yeah. right? And sometimes it feels like it's a busy week. Sometimes it's like, ah, eh, whatever. And it was one of those, like, a lot of stress going on. And our, our chief revenue officer was, like, overworking on the week. Like, and we kind of have a little bit of a policy, but it doesn't mean I can force them not to, right? But I was like, hey, please take a break on, you know, this. And they were afraid to ask. I said, well, who's going to do this for me? Who's this? I said, I will. Yeah. You know, I said, ask me. Oh, I don't want to do that. No, 
ask me, I'm your team member, just because I'm also your boss, I'm your part of your team. I'm your part of your team more than I am your boss. Same thing, and they're like, ah, oh. you know? And I'm like, yeah, I got this, I'll take this part, you keep moving forward, but promise me you'll have a good weekend, you know? And, and that's, sometimes you just have to have those moments, and like, but you have to do it as an example. Mm. And I, otherwise, if like, I, I hate it when I'm like, oh, nope, I'm gonna get off the computer now, and I don't do it just for myself, but it's also because I'm trying to set a stage, you yeah, know? The, the so. session yesterday that Gary did from Zoom, Worth rewatching. Okay. The challenges for hybrid work. Those are really good lessons for this. But yeah. we should Drew. go to others. Your turn. All right. Do you want me to review it or are you good? No, I'm good. I'm actually yeah. going to start with the second part first and then go back to the first. And I want to call back to something that Sam said earlier because this was profound for me in my journey as a leader. Emotional intelligence is something that I used to kind of look down on. I used to think that this isn't real, it's just a way for people who aren't smart to feel good about themselves. That's a horrible <laughs> thing to think, I'm just being candid here. Uh, yeah. But as I matured as a person and as a leader, I realized that it isn't. It's another set of skills, I love power skills, I'm gonna to totally power steal skills. that. So what we've done to instill both constant learning but also helping manage burnout on my team is we've adopted an emotional intelligence framework. Just like there's cybersecurity frameworks and cybersecurity standards, there are actual oh, documented frameworks that exist amazing. that you can learn, you can study, and you can practice. And just like coding, penetration testing, you can develop the skills, you can identify the situations, and apply the right tools and techniques. So we've adopted that as a leadership team. We're pushing that down through the organization so that every team member can become better at that set of skills that's, that's, to do their yeah. jobs better. And a way that we've applied that uh, in an organization I've been a part of, we had a very difficult transition with IT. And a lot of IT was, I'd say, very busy not being responsive to security. Mm -hmm. And that was really stressful on my team because nothing bothers a security professional more than there's a vulnerability and it's not patched. We need to update the software and it can't be done. We've got a risk that we need to fix and nothing happens. So using those tools with the team and having them have empathy for the other parts of IT that were overstrained, that had constraints, putting themselves in their shoes, not only helped to mitigate their stress levels because they realized they weren't being ignored, they weren't being disrespected, that they got to practice empathy themselves and they got to help relieve their own personal stress. And it wasn't a magic cure, there's no yeah. magic bullet here, but it really helped through that situation mm -hmm. and ultimately helped us further our security goals better because if they had just gotten stressed out, they might have withdrawn, they might have given up, they might have stopped. But instead, it fostered collaboration and better cooperation with those other IT teams as well. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's amazing that you guys, you're putting that through. That's like, we need that more and more and more in environments. It's, it's no different than like learning a language or like a like programming language or this or that and getting better at it as a software engineer over time. Same here, you're just getting better at human language and human components. Cash. I, I had a question for him first, though. Yeah, did, did, you, did you find it or did you develop the framework? Because I've seen the, some, but was it, did you professionally build it out with HR or was it one that was publicly available? No, no, I found it. And I actually, I also was getting executive coaching, which I would say is a very valuable thing to do. And my coach actually introduced me to several different frameworks. And then we were able to select the right one. There, I know, yeah. 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 Cash. So uh, I would like to share uh, uh, two different points. Uh, I think I completely agree with what Simon Graham mentioned about how we need to actually build that uh, culture of actually seeking help and fall back with an extended team as well. I'm not even talking about uh, CISO function, I'm talking about uh, the function beyond uh, security, right? Where sometimes you may need uh, an expertise coming from technology, sometimes development, sometimes you may need somebody from financials. So I think uh, uh, one of the core uh, point is like, I think we need to be open enough to build that culture of actually seeking a help at the right point in time, right? Uh, a lot of this successful cybersecurity incidences have caused not because of lack of technology. It's, it's a clear indication of uh, people really don't know what to do. Sometimes they know they have missed out because of the panic which is getting created and the pressure that's mounted on the CISOs and the CISOs functions to see what's going to happen the post-incident or post-crisis which, uh, which is caused in the organization. And that has to be handled in a different way, right? From our perspective, I, I feel uh, 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 being very empathetic is something which we have to nurture. We have to customize uh, because it is about the needs and emotions of the people. It cannot have a standard framework which can work all across. 
So you need to sit across, spend time, and put effort to understand the needs and emotions of the people to define what is required for that particular person. This is something which recently I learned when two years back I realized when pandemic has hit, there was a huge lack in terms of number of cybersecurity professionals available in the market. And that time, uh, while you really want to look at uh, the professionals to be groomed, I thought that the only way to look at it in the future is to create a talent pipeline as much as possible. And uh, while you want to create that, I realized the next generation, uh, young people who are about to join uh, in the professional world, they were not very clear about what they want, and they want to explore uh, opportunities beyond the defined portfolio, right? Uh, so one of the, uh, the points which I made ensure uh, in, in our ecosystem at least is like at least 20 to 25 percent of their current care will have a crisscross mechanism of learning something new which they are not having an expertise. In this way, you always have a support mechanism or a fallback mechanism inside the team. Mm -hmm. And second is like um, um, uh, this also helps to build a positive environment because they are not going to stay put with the same technology, same platform, same skill sets. It also helps them to get upskill so that in a market, I think they can face uh, very confidently and uh, they avoid monotony. And uh, of course, I think uh, uh, they, they learn uh, as a continuous process. I think this, this process really helped us in terms of actually creating an empathetic environment inside the ecosystem which has gone beyond security right now, because at the end of the day, I feel security function can't uh, uh, work or can't perform in silos, right? So we have to create a win-win situation where we have to influence the next circle of environment, which is technology and beyond technology. And that's how uh, I feel that uh, being empathetic in certain way will help us to actually get everybody together with a common objective of actually securing the enterprise. What you're basically doing is offering fluid options versus the no. Like, you know, a lot of like, times I've seen, I'd say like, a little bit more immature CISOs, not, not, not pointing fingers at anybody, but just in a general sense of the operation. Finance will come along and say, oh, we need like Windows because even though you're Mac, and it's like, no, well, don't say no or they won't call you first. Uh, you know, give them a path to get farther along from a security analyst to an engineer. Or, and, and if you're looking at like, you started like once and needs, what's the options? Like you want to show them that there's, you know, what's in front of you and also out there. And that's a, that's a really great approach. Thank you, Makesh. All right, so as we wrap up this insightful session, I want to extend a heartfelt uh, thank you to our panelists, uh, Graham, Makesh, Sam, and uh, Stephen. Thank you. Sorry for making fun of your name. We were just having fun of it earlier. Inside joke earlier. Uh, for their invaluable contributions. Uh, this was amazing, guys. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank your you, experiences and strategies have not only enlightened us, and you're welcome, <laughs> but also reminded us that the heart of cybersecurity is the human element. Empathy, as we've discussed, is not just a soft skill, power skill. And it's a critical component of our security frameworks and teams' well-being, and it can be learned, right? And so let's carry forward these strategies and perspectives shared today to empower our teams, strengthen our defenses, and foster a culture that values mental health as much as it does technical proficiency. Thank you to our audience for engaging with us in this vital conversation. Together, we make a difference in the cybersecurity world. Thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.